The Florida Podcast Network, the voice of Florida. From Mallory Square in Key West to the Governor's Mansion in Tallahassee and all points beyond, you're listening to the Florida Beer Podcast, powered by FloridaBeerBlog.com. Your source for all things related to the craft beer community in the Sunshine State. And now your host, Dave Butler. And here we are with part three of the awesome three-part series that is Odd Breed Wild Ales. Hello. Once again, it's another episode of the Florida Beer Podcast, powered by FloridaBeerBlog.com. This is Dave, your host and author, and we will get back into it. But first, make sure to subscribe to the podcast on the podcasting app of your choice. We do ask that you like us and leave a nice big review. That really does help us when it comes time to pay the bills and to get new followers. They're going to be looking for those nice, juicy five-star reviews. And hopefully you can provide that in exchange for all the awesome content that we have coming your way. So thank you very much. Make sure to follow us on social media as well. We are at Florida beer blog on Instagram and Twitter. FL beer blog is the handle on Facebook. Our websites are obviously floridabeerblog.com and floridabeerpodcast.com. Hopefully they're not too difficult to remember. We are also a proud member of the Florida Podcast Network, and you can find them at floridapodcastnetwork.com. The Facebook group is FPN Insiders. There's a lot of great shows that are on there right now. A lot of great shows that are coming soon, including this. The final episode at Oddbreed Wild Ales with Matt Manthe was an interview years coming I've been wanting to do it for quite some time. I finally had the chance to do it, and it was every bit as awesome as I was hoping that it would be. And hopefully you've been enjoying it as well. I probably could have gone on for another couple of episodes, but he had stuff to do. I had stuff to do. We had to kind of move on. But this last episode is going to talk a little bit about where he is now. I'm going to talk about the future a little bit because with Matt and with the fact that a lot of his bottle releases are bottle conditioned and they have to stay in the bottle for several months to get that conditioning. He already knows what's coming down the pipeline. He understands what's going to be released and when it's going to be released. And so he's got some of those releases that he's going to be giving us the details to. The other thing that I enjoyed the most about this is his description of the odd breed wild ales logo. And if you've noticed, it's a very rustic drawing of a kitty cat on top of a barrel And since I am partial to cats myself, I obviously enjoyed that particular logo, but learning the reasoning why just made it that much better. But enough of me talking. Now we're going to hear from the man himself to describe all of those things on this, our last episode of the Florida Beer Podcast featuring Matt Manthe of Odd Breed Wild Ales. We will catch you on the other side of the interview. In the meantime, crack open a beer and enjoy. While I understand that there are hops being used in a lot of these beers, I didn't realize that they were such an important part for some of them and could even, you know, these styles could even be bitter in some, you know, traditional brewings of. I've only had them as, you know, sours or sure. you know, something like that. So can you talk a little bit about hops and how hops can have, you know, different kinds of hops that you enjoy using and traditionally focus on styles? like you're making here. Yeah, I I think uh, hops are incredibly important with making these types of beers. There are a lot of brewers out there that will tell you the complete opposite. A lot of brewers that are using primarily or exclusively pellets, they're using maybe a little bit of high alpha acid hops at the beginning of the boil, and they're getting a beer that's you know, got maybe five IBUs in it. So the the old, and I, would, I wouldn't even necessarily say old, it seems old because it's just been something that people have been saying for so long, but it's still followed by most wild sour beer brewers today is that if you're making a sour beer, you shouldn't use many hops, that the hops are going to restrict the, the souring bacteria. And all that is true, but hops do so much more than that. First of all, they, they do help me regulate the amount of acidity that I want in the beer. So, of course, if I do want to make a beer that's less sour, then I do add more hops. But I use a combination of aged hops, which are whole cone. 
they're basically allowed to have a high level of oxidation and that brings out some new flavors in the hops. It also leads to a diminished flavor of some other compounds that are sometimes considered more sought after. But I still have the beta acids in the hops. Those do provide some bitterness still. They do restrict lactobacillus souring bacteria. But I also use a lot of hope, a lot of hops post-fermentation, you know, for, for dry hopping. And hops are also, especially American and New Zealand hops, are a great tool to use to add more citrus and tropical fruit character in your beer. And so the, the beer that I, I won the gold medal for last year at GABF was a blend of three beers. And one of those was brewed like an IPA and was fermented exclusively with our mixed culture. Still develops a little bit of acidity, but that was blended with two other beers in part to lend more of those tropical and citrus notes. And I feel that when you have a beer, a mixed culture beer, a sour beer, and the only thing you're using is some high alpha acid hops at the beginning of boil. It's what a lot of brewers do because it's easy, it's cheaper, it's less messy. You know, when I make my beers, I'm typically using a lot of aged hops. They're a pain in the ass to use. They take up a lot of space. They're a pain to clean out of the boil kettle at the end of the day. I mean, I literally climb into the kettle at Barrel of Monks right after I transfer the word out and I have to gather all the hops that I use. And I'm using, you know, 30 to 40 pounds of whole cone hops. Which is interesting, like aged hops seems to be kind of a misnomer because especially with whole cone, you know, you talk about those wet hops and it's like they just got plucked yesterday. If you don't use them by tomorrow, you may as well just throw the batch out. Sure. Yeah. (laughs) So, so I'm, I'm getting some, some wet hops this year for two different beers, one for our rare bottle club. And then the other one, it will be going into a wild double IPA that's spent a year in oak. And uh, will be then, then be re-fermented with local orange blossom honey on top of the wet hops. I'm getting a strata for that one. And the, the thing, though, about, about using whole cone hops and a good bit of hops, whether it be on the hot side or uh, post-fermentation, is that I really feel that they add to the mouthfeel of the beer. I think that a lot of beers that have a relatively low amount of hops added, and especially if they're those high alpha acid hops just out at the beginning of the boil, they lend a, a sour beer that has no middle to it. The mid palate is very thin and watery. The beer may taste really nice up front. And then the middle of the beer is like nothing. And you're like, well, what just happened? And then, and then maybe it finishes again with a little bit of flavor. I feel like the best mixed culture beers and the ones that I make that I like the most, they have a lot of depth of flavor. They have a lingering flavor that flavor carries through from start to finish without a bunch of bumps along the way, without the flavor profile just kind of falling off. And I think there's something unique about whole cone hops and that nowadays so many breweries are using pellets. They're using T90 hops. Now we have a lot of breweries that are using the cryo hops or the Lupo Max hops, the other different hop products and hop science. Hop science has come a long way and all that's really cool. But what they're doing in all of this is they're, they're removing parts of the hop cone that also lend flavor. And they're focusing mostly on those, those oils that are in the hops, some of the different flavor compounds. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But I feel like so many consumers are now tasting beers that don't taste like the whole hop, that don't taste like the actual plant anymore. And, uh, you know, the whole cone hops, uh, they call them T90 hops, first of all, which is T90 is a type of pellet hop. That's what most breweries use. They call it T90 pellets because it has 90% of the material of a whole cone hop. In other words, there's 10% of something that's missing. Now, I can't tell you exactly what the difference is because it's subjective, but I can tell Mm -hmm. you that when I taste a beer that's made with whole cone hops versus pellet hops, I can taste the difference. And I personally prefer that flavor of the whole cone hops more. They're, they are more difficult to work with. They're actually more expensive to purchase, which seems a little bit counterintuitive because they're not processed as heavily as pellets are. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I, I think I think hops are a really important thing in, in all beers, but especially in wild beers. And uh, it's something that I've been playing around with for years since I started at, at Bruzy. The focus of most of the beers that I was making with Brett were hoppy beers. Gotcha. And uh, maybe it's funny that you mentioned you know, processed versus whole. And we could also go that way with fruit as well. Sure. You know, obviously, most breweries you know, love their purees or mm-hmm. their flavorings and just sort of dump it in. You tend to go for the real thing yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's 
a lot of breweries that are using aseptic fruit puree. They're using concentrates. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. And especially if you're a larger brewery, and especially if you have beer that's in a grocery store, you got to, one, have a consistent product. <laughs> and fruit is a natural ingredient, right? So it's not always consistent. But aseptic puree does offer a higher level of consistency. It's available year round, and it's a lot more cost effective. If you're going to put a beer in a grocery store in a six pack, you know, you can't charge the kind of prices that I have to charge for my beer. Really the main reason why I'm using whole whole fruit and typically fresh fruit, typically local organic fruit, assuming it's something that, that grows local to me here, is just because I think it's a better product. And, you know, from my perspective, if I'm going to put a beer in a barrel for one, two, three, or four years, and then it's going to have a lot of fruit flavor on it, why would I want to dumb it down with aseptic fruit puree that's very one-dimensional? that you know just doesn't have any character. I feel like at that point I'm I'm kind of drowning out the the nicer qualities of that beer that I just spent all this time and and work into producing. It just it it just doesn't make sense to me to 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 use an inferior ingredient at that late stage of the process. I'd rather make a beer with no fruit than make a beer that has aseptic fruit puree. And even though you're using a lot of these whole fruits, the the beers aren't necessarily fruity in the way that you would go to the grocery store and pick up a fruit beer and have that sort of sure. taste like that. Yeah. And I think, you know, first of all, a lot of that is just because of the fact that I'm using real fruit. And unfortunately, so many people have been conditioned to believe that fruit tastes like some type of artificial flavor. You know, one of the examples I like to use is blueberry. Blueberries themselves don't taste anything like blueberry flavor does. And a lot of beers that are made with blueberries today, or say that they're made with blueberries, they're made with blueberry extract. And that doesn't resemble the real fruit at all. And I've had this conversation with some people that come into the tasting room and they say, hey man, I like your blueberry beer, but it doesn't taste like blueberries. And I say, well, when was the last time you had a blueberry? And you know, they, they have to think about it and they're like, man, it's been a long time, you know? And the thing is, when you use whole fruit, you're getting a lot of other flavors from that fruit. You're getting the complexity of multiple different flavors that are in there when you're using an aseptic puree, even though it is derived from that, that fruit from a natural product. I find that it tends to have a very one-dimensional flavor. And in the case of something like, say, peaches or raspberries, those are what I call loud fruits. And what I mean by that is just that they're, they have a very recognizable flavor profile. Yeah. It's very strong. Mm -hmm. And there's not a whole lot of nuance there. And I don't mean that necessarily in a bad way. I do make usually a few peach beers every year, usually with the, with the local Florida peaches, although I have used peaches from California as well. Mm -hmm. But a little bit of, the, of that type of fruit goes a long way. But if you're using something like, say, Starfruit was the last fruit beer that I used. And I used local Starfruit. I used three pounds of fruit per gallon of beer. It's a relatively subtle flavor. It's a complex flavor. I feel like it's very complementary to the base beer. If someone tries that beer and they've never had Starfruit before, they're probably not going to recognize the Starfruit flavor in that beer. Yeah. I think that's okay, but it all depends on what you're trying to achieve. And you know, that type of mindset wouldn't work for most breweries. If you're selling a beer in a six pack, regardless of what type of price point you're trying to achieve, you know, it's it's not going to be a concept that most consumers can kind of grasp. And, and with all of these incredibly complex beers and styles that you don't generally find when you go to World of Beer or when you go to Yard House or you definitely go get when you go to Publix or something, how much education do you have to do to people that are just coming in wanting a beer, not really understanding who odd breed is the educational aspect is is a big part of it and it's it's really tough so odd breed beer is actually probably best received the farther away it gets from florida <laughs> and uh, something that seems seemed counterintuitive to me anyway at first but the the truth is we we do best in more competitive markets you know i do a lot of distribution more people in california and in philadelphia and out in the pacific northwest understand the kind of beer that i'm making than people in florida do and part of that is just because of that educational aspect and you know we have green bench here in florida and they do some some great barrel aged mixed culture beers we don't have anyone else really that 
that produces maybe more than a, a few, if even that many, you know, mixed culture barrel aged beers per year. And so I've actually found, unfortunately, that it's gotten harder over the years for me to explain my beer to the casual beer drinker who comes in, in part because of the proliferation of kettle sours and most recently the proliferation of smoothie sours or sour beers that are otherwise kettle sours or even not kettle soured at all. There are a lot of beers now where it's literally a beer that is dosed with a lactic acid or some other type of food grade acid. And then it is stuffed with a bunch of unfermented fruit puree. And uh, and it's creating a lot of beers now that the brewery is calling a sour beer. But the truth is, it's got tons of sugar in it. You know, it's got like 800 calories or more in a serving. And it I... logs up draft lines. And, you know, what I make is obviously just completely different from that. And And to a lot of people... You know, when I first opened almost five years ago, I had a lot of people coming in and their ex- their experience with sour beer, if they hadn't had much of it, was oftentimes either traditional Lambic from Belgium or it was beer from, say, Cascade or the brewery. And that type of beer is so much more similar to what I'm doing mm. than a lot of the beers that you can otherwise find that are sour nowadays. Yeah, and, especially the smoothie sour with, yeah. the, with the chunks at the yep. bottom when you pour it out. And- yeah. I mean, one of the things that I'm, I'm constantly having to explain to my customers here is, you know, I have my draft menu organized by into three categories. So light citrusy and tropical is one category. Those are typically my beers that are in that range of, say, four to six-ish percent alcohol. They're pale and colored. They're very light-bodied, easy drinking, super refreshing. Those are the kind of beers that really I, I made for the Florida climate here. Then I have beers that are made with fruit, and that varies anywhere from like two to four beers on my menu. It's all going to be whole fruit, usually fresh local fruit. Those are my most sour beers on the menu. A lot of customers that come in, they go directly to that category and they say, oh, I want one of the fruited beers. That's Those are going to be the sweetest. And like, no, actually, if you want the sweetest beers, look at my dark and strong category at the bottom there, <laughs> because those are beers that have high alcohol. The alcohol is eventually going to inhibit the souring bacteria, yeah. which, and anytime you make a beer that's high alcohol, it's going to have some residual sweetness, right? There's still going to be some, some malt body, some, some extra depth to it because mm. of that. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't seem to understand that when they come in and they ask, They say, well, you know, I'm kind of new to sour beer. I want your least sour beer. And I direct them to the narrow band with the reality, which is 15% alcohol. (laughs) And it drinks like a combination of port, dessert, wine, and lambic. (laughs) And, you know, they, a lot of people don't understand that. A lot of people like it, fortunately. But a lot of people don't understand that when they look at the menu and they're like, wait, so the 15% beer is what I should drink if... I want something that's the least intense as far as acidity. And it's like, yeah, that's that's what you should go for. <laughs> but, you know, when I'm using whole fruit, I'm fermenting all of the fruit. And so there's no sugar left from that fruit. Fruit has natural acidity. And I've had so many people that tell me, well, no, but but peaches are sweet. And I said, yeah, well, when you eat a peach, it still has a bunch of sugar in it. Yeah, my, my yeast is fermenting out all of that sugar. When it comes to education, one of the things that I absolutely adore about you and about Odd Breed are your Instagram posts. Oh, thanks. Because you will describe in great detail the reason behind the beer, the history of the beer, how the beer was produced, and just a level that is just not seen in the craft beer industry by producers or people like me, shall we say, why did you thankfully decide to start doing that? And what has the reception been from both the brewing industry and just the average craft beer aficionado? I've had a lot of people tell me that they really appreciate those descriptions. And and I'm happy to hear that because I I do take a good bit of time to, to put all that info together. But a lot of it really just goes back to the whole aspect of education, right? I, I want people to understand what they're tasting why the beer tastes the way that it does, why I, I did this and I did that and what I was trying to achieve. I also want people to understand that I'm not just haphazardly blending things together with no real intention. You know, there, there's a lot of purpose behind what I do here and it's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. I spend a lot of time thinking about what I'm going to do, how I'm going to do it, what I want to achieve what I think will happen if I do something this way versus that way. And because these beers take so long for me to make and there's so much work that goes into it, I feel like that last step in the process is trying to tell the story to the consumer. And I feel like if I didn't rush anything else, why would I rush this part? 
you know, and fortunately I've had a lot of customers tell me that they appreciate the descriptions that they find that they're very accurate as far as the flavor profile for the beer. But, you know, it's, it's a lot of work making these beers and also if they don't sell, it's very risky. And so I, I try to, and maybe I overanalyze it sometimes, but I, I try to, to be consistent in that approach from the beginning until the end. And that's got to be especially difficult for the bottle conditioned beers because mm-hmm. you put it in a bottle and you will not see it again for months, if not a year yeah. or more down the line. Is it a little bit riskier? Is it a little bit more nerve wracking to hope that a bottle conditioned beer is going to come out the way that you want it to over something that you know lives in the punch ins before you keg it? So there, there's no substitute for experience. And I feel like the whole bottle conditioning process and all my kegs are naturally conditioned too. It takes a long time. There's a, there's a lot of me kind of sampling some things from the barrels, trying to come up with blends. And then it's it's really predicting what that that blend is going to taste like once that beer is finished with bottle conditioning, you know, sometimes several months or a year later. And so I do have a warehouse that's three miles from here where I do all my bottle conditioning and keg conditioning, but I, I let the beers naturally condition for a minimum of three months and up to about a year or so. And sometimes when you blend certain things together and you think, all right, well, yeah, I could see how this is going to taste once it's cold and carbonated. And uh, then once the beer is ready, after it's had time to uh, to kind of, you know, marinate and develop in the bottle together over several months or more, it ends up becoming something different. And And that's there's there's no easy way to figure out what it's going to do. You just have to kind of know based on your process, based on your microbes, based on the types of beers that you're blending, you you just learn, you know, from your own experience, you know, what's what's going to happen and hopefully you end up being right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the flip side of that is you already know what bottles are going to be released for the rest of the year cuz you've theoretically already yeah. bottled them and yep. you're just waiting to when you know it's time to release. Correct? correct. Yeah, yeah, I mean the the beer that I just released, Mezcal Funk, is the only beer I've released this year. We're in August now. It's the only beer I've released this year that I bottled this year. I bottled that beer January 6th. Interesting. And so, you know, I operate on a completely different timeline than a, than a typical brewery. And for me, one thing I think that's very unique about just this, this type of brewery, and, and I haven't spoken to, to other brewers about this within my niche, so I don't know how their mindset is. But for me, I actually really like bottling days. And in part because it is the last step in the process that I can actively influence the outcome of the beer. Whereas, you know, for typical brewery, most guys, especially guys that have been in the industry for a while and head brewers, they don't like canning their beer. They don't like bottling their beer. They don't like putting it into a keg because it's essentially already carbonated finished beer and it's not going to change in that final package. For me, you know, when I'm bottling up a beer, it's a beer that I may have worked on for a few years, you know, maybe even four or five years. And once it gets into that bottle, it's like, all right, now the cork is in there. Now the cap's on there. Now I just got to let it sit and I got to trust the process and, you know, it's out of my hands. And I, I kind of enjoy that, that last little final aspect of it because I can influence, you know, the way that the beer develops and it ages when it's in my barrels, when it's re-fermenting on fruit depending on you know how I process the fruit or how long I'm letting it sit on the fruit or if I'm adding in some fresher beer to help kickstart that fermentation. All those things are within my control. But once it's in that bottle, it's just the it's left to my my microbes, you know, and and to a certain extent, those are those are my babies. You know, I, I put my mixed culture together almost nine years ago now and it's developed and evolved. With, with some of my guidance, you know, but uh, I get a lot of people that ask me about the logo and the, the cat and all that. And it's, it's a reference to the type of beer that I make here. And that it's not, if, if typical beer production and brewing is analogous to a dog where you can train it and it's predictable and it's going to follow you around and all that, a cat is always wild, right? A cat is always independent. It's going to do its own thing. Sure, you can provide an environment for it and hope that it likes you back and all that kind of stuff, but you can only do so much. That's funny, which is funny because I saw the cat once and probably <laughs> sleeping above us, but I'm not totally sure. So this means, so you know what bottles are coming out because like you said, you're about to celebrate your fifth anniversary, which yep. is amazing. What kind of things do you have that are coming up in the next couple of months? Yeah. So my next release, I'm, I'm pretty excited about. I'm going to do a double bottle release towards the end of Greater Fort Lauderdale a Beer Week. And uh, I'm releasing two wild loggers. And so one of them is a collaboration that I did with Lincoln Spear down in Miami, 
We brewed essentially a North German style Pilsner. The bulk of that batch was released at Lincoln's Beard. It was called Odd News, kind of a, a, a hint at their, their flagship Pilsner, which is called Old News. But uh, I took some of that beer after fermentation at their place, after cold lagering, and I put it in one of my barrels for eight months. And then after barrel aging it, I did a very light dry hop with the same hops that we added in the boil kettle, which were Herzberger and Spalt, which are both really nice traditional German noble hops. That beer, because it already went primary fermentation with the lager yeast, it does retain a little bit of that lager character. And it's also a relatively bitter beer and a dry beer. And so it developed almost no acidity. It's mostly about that earthy, kind of slightly citrusy Brett funk. I think it turned out great. And then uh, I also have a beer that I'm calling Brett of Fest beer. And so some people may recall, I guess it would have been around late last year, I had a beer on draft that I called Farmhouse Pills. Farmhouse Pills is a beer that I brewed at Barrel of Monks, a single decoction, essentially brewed like a Dortmunder export pilsner. And it was fermented with lager yeast here. I did open fermentation on it. It started fermentation cold, but because I don't have any glycol cooling, the yeast was allowed to naturally warm up. So it finished fermentation kind of like a steam beer at about 60 degrees, meaning that it develops a slight ale type character while still retaining most of that those lottery notes up front. That beer then went into barrels. I believe it was about 14 months, 15 months. I don't recall exactly offhand, but but that beer also, I think, developed really nicely, has almost no acidity but it's a very nice, easy drinking beer with a a ton of Brett complexity. But I'll be releasing that September 17th, doing a little kind of Oktoberfest thing for that, I guess. And then I've got a collaboration that I brewed with my my friend Samuel Fenor, and it's a it's his recipe for an imperial stout. Fermented it here with a Norwegian farmhouse yeast and then put it into one of my American oak barrels that I used for a beer called Reality is Obscure, which was basically a beer that spent three years in oak, sent it off to a lab. It was a 16.87% alcohol, very big boozy beer. I emptied the barrel from, emptied that beer out of the barrel and then put in this stout, Sam's recipe, and, and also his, his brewing partner, Jim Walsh. But that will be released October 8th. It has just a hint of tartness to it. It's really has a lot of similarities from my understanding anyway, because I can't taste it. But it has supposedly a lot of similarities to old British style Russian imperial stouts that had Britannomyces in them, uh, which is a very common thing back, you know, 100 years ago, I guess. Uh, that was viewed to be kind of the ultimate beer style, the real connoisseur's beer style. But for my my anniversary party, I'm going to be releasing three beers. One of them is a blend of five beers, and they were all aged in French oak barrels. Two of those beers were dry hopped. One of them had a little bit of peaches added. It's a really cool beer. I packaged that one up back in early March of this year. So it's fully ready to go. It's tasting great right now. The other beer that I'll be releasing was a blend of a couple of wild IPAs that spent one year in oak and then were re-fermented with 300 pounds of organic mangoes. I used phantasm powder during that re-fermentation, which is derived from New Zealand Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc grapes. Really ups, ups the kind of tropical notes in the beer. And then that beer was also dry hopped with Zaka and El Dorado. And I, I opened a bottle of that last night to check on it, see how it was coming along. And it's probably the most tropical flavored beer I think I've ever made. That sounds and utterly it's, amazing. It's a cool beer. Light acidity on that, super drinkable, really complex. And then um, the other beer that I'm going to release will be Oddities and Outliers Blend 3. And so that's a blend of three beers. Really the backbone in that beer is a Lambic-inspired beer that spent three and a half years in barrels. And then it's blended with a Hoppy Saison and just a touch of a wild lager to kind of just even things out. But uh, but it's a really cool beer, lots of complexity on that. That's one that I expect to age really well. That's awesome. So it sounds like you've got a lot of stuff coming up, which is amazing. So, I mean, not not just to, not just that, but obviously the giant barrels of fun sure. behind me. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And yeah. Definitely got to try some more. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> so that was it. Three awesome episodes. Thank you so much to Matt Manthe and the Oddbreed Wild Ales team for everything that they were able to do to get this to happen, which is basically Matt. Um, he does quite a lot of stuff himself, and it's amazing to see. But with somebody as talented and knowledgeable as Matt Manthe is when it comes to brewing, you kind of want to just let him shine, and literally everything that you get is going to be absolutely worth it. 
And trust me, every single beer that I've ever had of his has been absolutely worth it. He knows what he's doing. And I completely understand when people are flying over from Switzerland and making sure to carve out some time just to try his beers. That makes perfect sense to me. We're going to be back next week with another episode as to who it is. You're just going to have to follow us on social media to find out when it drops and who it is. You can follow us at Florida Beer Blog on Instagram and Twitter. FL Beer Blog is on Facebook. You can also follow Florida Podcast Network as we are a proud member of them. You can also go ahead, like, and subscribe our podcast on the podcasting app of your choice. Please make sure to do all of that. Our intro announcer is Jeff Brozovich. Executive producer and Grand High Puba is Jemmy Lagagna. I forgot to mention Steve Pacala, our field producer. Can't forget him. We will be back next week. We will be back with some awesome beer stuff. As for who it is, you'll have to wait and see. But trust me, hopefully you have now gone out and tried to source as much odd breed wild ales as you can. And that'll just have to tide you over until next week. This is Dave, your host and author, signing off. And thank you so much for listening. And drink Florida Craft.